Good morning. Welcome to Rich Christ. Please stand as we gather to worship this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. scripture blessed is the nation whose god is the lord and on this holiday weekend uh, we gather together to worship and we ask this question are we a blessed nation in just a moment we're going to sing a song god uh, not god bless usa but uh, god bless america and as we sing that song i want to ask the question 
Are we a nation that God can bless? Are we simply asking God to bless what we choose to do and, and how we choose to live with no regard for Him? Or can we say we want to live the kind of life and be the kind of people whom God can bless? Big difference in there. In, uh, in Psalm 145, uh, 146 and verse 5, it says, uh, Happy is the one whose God is the God of Jacob, whose help is in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. We want to be happy and have help and have hope because of all God does for us. In response, guess what? God promises to bless that kind of a nation. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you have given us. Thank you for the hope and the joy that we have in Jesus. Thank you for our nation and the great independence that we celebrate even this weekend as we come in here from fireworks and celebrations and cookouts and all different things that are happening. May we gather, not simply asking you to bless us, but asking that we might live a life worthy of being blessed by God. May that be our hope. May that be our faith. May that be our joy as we gather for worship today in Jesus' name. understand, of course, go ahead and be seated for just a second. You understand, of course, that we were just praying and asking that God would indeed bless America. And, uh, and so our, our prayer will continue to be that he will do what only he can do. And especially in these crazy COVID times, uh, in these crazy race relations times, that God will indeed bless our country. And, and like is often talked about, make us great again. Uh, we are a country that is founded on awesome uh, Judeo-Christian principles, and, and uh, we just want to ask that God would do what only He can do. So thank you for praying as you were singing. My name is Shay Reiner. I am the pastor of Discipleship Ministries here. I just want to share a couple of things that are going on in the form of what we call our big three. So for the uh, foreseeable future, our worship schedule is going to stay just like it is right now. We'll be meeting uh, and gathering on campus at 9 o'clock 
and at 1030, we will continue not having our connect groups meeting on campus, but we encourage you to zoom along with all of our classes that are meeting out there in the virtual world. And uh, speaking of the virtual world, um, it is almost time for Vacation Bible School as scheduled when we would typically have it on campus. We are not going to be having Vacation Bible School on campus. That does not mean, however, we are not having Vacation Bible School. Uh, we are doing virtual VBS this year. If you were to go to the homepage of our website, then you can find a link to our virtual VBS page, and you'll find all the information that you need for a great week of VBS. In fact, I would even say that we've got opportunities with VBS this year like we have never had before. As you have opportunities to invite kids from your neighborhood into your home, to do VBS with your family, and I take advantage of that. There's some great resources on our virtual VBS website. Hey, want to take just a second and just welcome our guests and say thank you for choosing to be here with us during these crazy times. And uh, we know there's a lot of other places you could be, like the beach, which a lot of people are at these days, this Fourth of July weekend. But thank you for joining us. Um, and then I would say too that. Uh, we're receiving our offering these days in a very different way. We've got a, a box at the back where you can uh, just drop your offering in there. You can also um, make your offering available uh, through our website. And we just want to say thank you for your generosity uh, week in and week out. And if you are a guest, we do not expect you to give. Uh, you are our guest here. In fact, we would love for you to stop by our uh, guest services table in the fellowship hall if you've not already done so, and we'd like to actually give you a gift as you um, take the time to just to let us know that you were here. So uh, thank you guys for being here. We are excited about worshiping together this morning and, and lifting up the awesome name of Jesus Christ. So let me pray for us, and then we will continue to worship. Father, thank you so much for the fact that we can enjoy the freedom to gather in the name of Jesus and to worship in his name. And would you remind us all over again that, that it is for freedom that we have been set free in Christ. And as we uh, just worship together right now, would you remind us of all that Jesus has done for us? And it's in his name we pray. Amen. as we continue to worship. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now Waiting me The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name Oh, yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy all my days Oh, yes, I will Count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now And in the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to pray. Glorify, glorify, 
name of all names Nothing can stand against And I choose to praise Glorify, glorify the name of all names Nothing can stand against Lord God, we know one thing is for sure. You are the God that never fails, and you will not fail us now, for we know you will work everything out. Even in our lowest valleys, we will lift your name high and glorify you and sing your praises. As we read from your word today, open our ears and eyes and hearts so that we will hear and see and feel your presence more clearly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. How many of you went to fireworks last night? Raise your hand. How many of you heard fireworks last night? Raise your hand. Okay. A few more folks. You know, I heard that uh, Roxborough was the only place having fireworks around, so they said a large crowd was going to show up. Uh, Pam and I and other family members, we went to Roxborough last night, and folks showed up. How many of you, in fact, were in Roxborough last night for the fireworks, all right? Great. So it was a, it was a good crowd up there. I don't know if you know this or not, but, but fireworks at the 4th of July have a lot to do with the founding of our nation, and uh, specifically back to the year uh, 1814, during the War of 1812, uh, one of our forts, Fort McHenry in Baltimore, was being bombarded by the English. And uh, as that fort was being bombarded, uh, one of our uh, 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 citizens at that time, Francis Scott Key, was watching the battle take place. And all through the night, he kept seeing the bombs exploding as the fort was being attacked, not knowing which way the battle was going to go. The next morning, as the sun was rising up, he looked out across the harbor, and there in Fort McHenry flew the American flag. And being overcome with that, he wrote uh, a poem, the fourth stanza, now which we call the Star Spangled Banner, our, our national anthem. Uh, he did that in gratitude to God. Francis Scott Key has been called for generations America's poet, patriot, and Christian. Francis Scott Key was a man of strong faith and a man who, uh, uh, who knew the Lord, walked with the Lord, and wore his faith, and along with many of the other founders of our nation, uh, exhibited uh, their Christian faith in all that they did. The founding of our nation, in the eyes of many, was, was very strongly a move of God, unlike any other. That still, we feel the consequences of even today. Let me ask you a question. I want you to raise your hand in just a moment if you can identify specifically, not just in general, but specifically if you've ever been in a place personally or in a group or in a church or even something nationwide? Have you ever been in a time when you can say you saw or experienced firsthand a genuine move of God? Who would raise their hand and say that? I have seen or experienced a genuine move of God. Many of us have, have done that. So I want us to think about that today because our, our verse, our key verse for today, if you have your Bibles, is Acts chapter 19 and verse number 20. Acts 19 and verse number 20. We're continuing to talk about living a life on mission, what that looks like, what that entails, and part of that is being available to see a move of God in our life, through our life, in our nation, and even through our nation to impact the nations of the world, to impact people that have gathered around us. Now listen to this, this verse. Acts chapter 19 and verse 20 says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. In the circumstances of Acts chapter 19, the word of God was going out. 
and it was going out, and people were hearing, and they were responding, and, and there was what, what we, we might call a spiritual awakening and revival. A spiritual awakening, by definition, is when in a community or in an area or a region, large numbers of people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's as if their spirit is being awakened by the Holy Spirit to their need for Jesus. They're coming to faith in Christ. A revival happens when God's people, the Christians, are reawakened uh, and renewed in their faith. So, so in Acts chapter 19, verse 20, a spiritual awakening is happening because the word of, the God, uh, word of God was going forth mightily and it was prevailing or it was making an impact in the community. Now, I want to ask you uh, your opinion this morning concerning the word of God going forth mightily. Would you say, or I would ask this, at what level would you say today the word of God is going forth in the United States of America? Would you say, for example, the word of God is going forth mightily and is having an impact from sea to shining sea, from Maine to, to California, from, from Oregon to Florida and everywhere in between? Would you say that that's the word, of, the word of God is having a, a great impact? Would you say otherwise that the Word of God seems to be absent? We can't find the, word, the impact of the Word of God anywhere. We've talked for, for months about how the local church is struggling, and a thousand churches every year are going out of business, closing their door, never to reopen again as that particular church. Even locally, the churches in our own Baptist association who have ceased to exist, it's staggering and it could be depressing. Are we saying that the Word of God is thriving, or the Word of God is suffering, or the Word of God is absent? Are we saying that the Word of God going forth is growing, or is it quiet, or is it impacting? What is it about the Word of God? I want, I want to ask you, think about what would your answer be to the impact of the Word of God in our world, in our nation, during these days? Now let me ask you this question. Would you like to see a repeat of what we just read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. Would you like to see the Word of God, the Bible, impact people's lives in your family, in your community, in our state, in our nation, and in our world? Would you be willing to say, I would like to see the Word of God impact people mightily and prevail just like we read about in Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. Very quickly, if you'd like to see that in our world today, just raise your hand real quick. You can put it right back down, but all of us seem to be in agreement. We want to see God move and God work in these great ways. Let me ask you to stand with me, if you will. I'm going to pray for that very thing we just talked about, and then while we're standing, I'm going to read our passage of Scripture from Acts chapter 19. So let's pray together as we begin. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we look back on men and women uh, like those of Francis Scott Key, who, out of a strong sense of Christian faith, prayed and recognized your hand on the founding of our nation. Thank you, Lord, that though we're founded to be a more perfect union, we're far from perfect today, Lord, but help us to desire to become more perfect. But our Heavenly Father, also help us to recognize that there are those seasons of history we read about them in the pages of American history. We read about them in the pages of Scripture. Those seasons of time when a great spiritual awakening took place where people in, in a geographic region came to faith in Christ and, and revival swept and, and great moves of God were recorded. And it was a wonderful thing so that the people were blessed and Jesus was glorified. As we signified just a moment ago, Lord, right here in this place, we pray that it would happen again. Lord, we know we can't produce it. We can do our very best, but we can't produce anything like a move of God. Help us to humble ourselves and to seek you and to pray, O oh God, that you would, through your Holy Spirit and through your word, through your Christians and through your church, help us, Lord, to recognize that, the Lord, you can do it again, and we pray that you would impact us, Lord that we might impact the world for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, will you remain standing? Let me read for you Acts chapter 19 and verses 11 through 20. And, the, and the, the theme today is sometimes, not every time, but sometimes God chooses to bring a spiritual awakening or revival. Sometimes God chooses to do that in the midst of tumultuous times. Did you know that? 
Sometimes God moves in the midst of tumultuous times, turmoil, in order to bring about a spiritual awakening or a revival. Now, my opinion, if that's true, revival could be just around the corner. Don't you think that's true today? So, so think about that as we read about what happened in Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell among them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. And then we get to our key verse. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Sometimes God chooses to bring spiritual awakening and revival in the midst of chaos and turmoil when the whole country seems to be turned upside down. Even so, Lord, send it now. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. So in the moments that we have this morning, I want to point out to you, based on this passage of Scripture, three important truths that we need to take note of in our life, in our church, and in our nation. And the first truth I want to point out is this. You cannot accomplish the will of God if you are not a follower of Jesus. Now, let that sink in just a little bit. You and I, either one, together or individually, we cannot accomplish the will of God if we are not a follower of Jesus. If you want to see God's will accomplished, you better be a follower of Jesus by knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Notice verse 13, it says, The sons of Sceva Sceva said, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. These seven sons of Sceva, these Jewish exorcists, were going around uh, to, to people that had evil spirits in them. I don't know what you think about evil spirits. I think they're real. Let me give you one, one piece of evidence that lets you know that I think they're real because it says so in the Bible. Amen? So, so these seven sons of Sceva were Jewish. They were not Christians, but they were exorcists. They were going around and calling evil spirits to come out of people. And in this case, they were saying, in the name of Jesus that Paul talks about. Now, I'm not a Christian, but I'm going to use the name of Jesus that Paul's talking about. Why did they say it that way? Well, first of all, they were not Christians. But secondly, in that time frame, in Acts chapter 19, it records that amazing things were happening through the ministry of of this man named Paul. You know Paul, he was a church planter, he was a missionary, his life had been changed by Jesus, he was Jewish, he encountered Christ, his life had been turned upside down, and now he was going out to all the known world that he could find and telling people about Jesus. And in Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, it says this, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, that's verse 11. Notice it does not say that Paul was doing phenomenal ministries miracles. It says God was doing it. You see, Paul understood, Paul knew, and Paul was quick to to recognize, this is not me doing these things. This is what God is doing. You remember a few weeks ago, we talked about how Paul and Barnabas went to the city, and as they were sharing about Jesus and God was moving, they thought that Paul and Barnabas were these Greek mythological gods, Zeus and Hermes. They said, oh, no, no, no. It's not about us. It's about the one true God. And so Paul was very aware, very quick to say, this is not about me, this is about Jesus. And so it says in verse 11, God was doing these miracles through Paul by his hands. And notice verse 12, it's an amazing testimony of what God was doing. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched Paul's skin were carried away to the sick, 
and their diseases left them, and evil spirits were coming out of them. Isn't that, isn't that amazing to see what was happening in that day? I mean, if he had had a handkerchief and wiped his forehead and went and then touched somebody, they were healed or, or evil spirits coming out of them. We, we, we're not told exactly how and what and all, but, but, but that's what was going on. And, and so in that light, word was getting out. And Paul, it was becoming very well known. Now, in that day, Jewish uh, priests would often go out and they would try to perform exorcisms. And, and, uh, and as they did that, here, they're, uh, uh, they're using the name of Jesus and the name of Paul. Why would they do that in this case? Because of the reputation of Paul. Because of what they had seen, because of what they had heard, because they, everybody was talking about the fact, did you see what happened when they took that handkerchief of Paul's and put it on that person? They were healed. Did you see what happened when his tent-making apron was touched by this person? The, the evil spirit in them came out. And so, so these Jewish exorcists, these seven sons of Sceva, these brothers, they said, we're going to get in on that action. Even though we're not Christians, we're going to get in on this action. So they were going around, and they were saying to people with evil spirits, in the name of Jesus, you know, that Paul talks about, come out. And so that's what was going on here in this situation. And what we need to understand here, what this, what this teaches us is that, is that there are no stepchildren in the kingdom of God. Let me say it that way. There, there are no stepchildren in the kingdom. You're either a child of God or you're not. And if you're going to accomplish the will of God, you have to be personally a follower of Jesus. No, notice again what, what the man with the evil spirit said to these seven brothers. He said, Jesus, I know. In fact, we could go into a long discourse on what the evil spirits know about Jesus. Here's what they know about Jesus more than anything. He is the Son of God. They know that. So Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize, because God was moving in great ways. But, but the tone of this passage, when, when the man with the evil spirit is talking to these seven brothers, he says, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize. But then in a very condescending way, he asks this question, who are you? <laughs> who do you think you are? I mean, I know about Jesus and Paul. Who, who do you think you are? And it's just a reminder, again, that if we're not rightly connected to God through faith in Jesus, then we're not rightly connected to God and God cannot use us to accomplish His will and will not be pleasing to God because we, because we are not those uh, with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example from Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is talking. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, when the time comes and you stand at the door of heaven, the gate of heaven, however that's going to work, when you get there, not everybody that says, oh yeah, Jesus is Lord, not at that moment, everybody that says that is, is not going to get in. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. If you want to go to heaven, you better make sure you're doing the will of the Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. Verse 22, on that day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, notice the phrase, in your name? Did, did we not cast out demons in your name? That's what these seven brothers were doing. In the name of Jesus that Paul talks about, come out of that man. And Jesus says on that day, people will say, Jesus, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many mighty works in your name? So you ought to let us in, Jesus. We were doing good things and making you look good. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In that moment, Jesus says, you can talk about all the things you did for me, but if you don't know me, you're not getting in. Notice again, verse 21. He says, only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Only those that do the will of God are getting into heaven. What is the will of God? Verse 23 tells us to know Jesus, to know him. Not to know about him, not to, be a, not to say, well, I know about Jesus once removed. Nobody's going to get there and say, well, you know, I should be able to get to heaven because my mama knew Jesus. Nobody's going to stand there and, and Jesus say, why should I let you in? Nobody's going to be able to say, well, because my kids knew Jesus and I used to drop them off at church. That ought to let me in. It doesn't work that way. Only those that know him. Now, here's the good news. The ability to know God through faith in Jesus is open to every person. Every person. In fact, in, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is patient towards you, 
not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That everybody, it's God's will that everybody come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he, wants, he wants you on this side, and you on this side, and you on this side. And he wants all those that are, that, are, that are protesting, and all those that are rioting, and all those in this group, and that group, and this shade, and that shade, and this, this Christian group, and that He wants all of us to go to heaven. Do you know that, right? You know that, right? When you, we see people on the news that maybe drive us crazy and, and, and make us angry, God wants them to go to heaven. That none perish. Well, how do we do that? Many places in the Bible tell us the simple way to get to heaven. John 5, 24 is just one of them. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Whoever hears my words and believes on him that sent me has eternal life. You hear about him and you believe his death, his burial, his resurrection, and you accept him as your Savior, turning from your sins. That's how you get to heaven. And listen, let me reiterate it one more time. You and I will never accomplish the will of God until we become followers of Jesus. And if you don't hear anything else I say today, understand that you and I will never accomplish the will of God, including going to heaven, until we know and follow Jesus. Not once removed like these seven brothers were, but know him personally. I want to encourage you today, if you don't know Jesus personally, before you leave, find somebody. Find one of our deacons. Find one of our staff members. Find your connect group leader. Find somebody to help you know about Jesus. We would be glad to talk to you. Let me give you a second truth that we see in this passage also, and that is you cannot overcome evil spirits without the power of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned a minute ago I believe in evil spirits because the Bible says there are evil spirits. Now, I don't go looking for evil spirits to blame when my team loses. I don't go looking for evil spirits to blame when, when bad things happen. Uh, I don't go looking for evil spirits around every corner and under every rock. I don't believe that there's that many, and I don't believe that, that that's where they are. But I do believe that they're there. And I believe if I'm ever going to be successful against an evil spirit, an evil one, an evil force, then I know I can't do it on my own. I have to have something beyond my strength and my ability if I'm ever going to confront anything with an evil power behind it. What we see here, I read for you just a moment ago, this man with the evil spirit, when, when these seven brothers got around him, he jumped up and he whooped. Can I, can I say that in church? Whooped. He jumped up and whooped all seven of them by himself. In fact, let me read the verse for you. Verse 16 says, the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them. I guess that's more socially acceptable. He leaped on them, mastered all of them, which means he had the upper hand. He controlled all of them. And then it says he overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Let me say two things about this scene. And I, I want to kind of set it for you. I don't know exactly what it might have looked like, but, but think with me about what, this could have, what could have happened here. This man's in his house. He's got this evil spirit, and, and maybe it's driving him mad. Maybe it, it is making him think evil thoughts. Maybe it's leading him to do evil things. Maybe he wants his spirit gone and out of him, but it won't, it won't let go. It won't go. So, so, so the family's called in the seven brothers. You know, maybe they have a reputation. The seven brothers of Sceva will exercise the demons in your life for a, a small fee of, you know, whatever it is. Fill in the blank. So they call in the seven brothers, the seven sons of Sceva. They gather around this guy, and, and one by one, they start saying, in the name of Jesus that Paul talks about, come on out. In the name of Jesus, you know, the, this guy Paul, we've heard about, we, 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 come on out. And this, that's when the Spirit says, you know, well, I know Jesus and I know about Paul, but, you know, who do you think you are? And it's at that moment, it says that the evil spirit jumped up and and, and I'm going to say it again, whooped them. Just whooped them real good. Two things I want to say about this, about this scene. One is, it's got to have been a humorous scene. It's got to have been funny. Have you ever seen, I think back to, to the Three Stooges. You know who the Three, the three Stooges are? I picture Larry, Moe, and Curly. And, and they've done something, and they're trying to get out of a room as quick as they can. And, and instead of running out single file, they're grabbing each other, pulling them back so I can get out first. They'll pull them out so I can get out first. And they're just like this big tumult of, of just, it's a big wrestling match. And before you know it, they all seven get out. But it says they were all wounded. They had been beat up somehow, maybe a bloody lip, a black eye, a bruised rib. I don't know what it was, but they were all wounded some way, and they were all, their clothes, they left their clothes behind. They were naked. That's how they ran out. That's what the Bible says, by the way. It's got to have been a humorous scene for those on the outside looking in. 
It's got to have been humorous. But the second description I would give to this scene is, it had to have been scary. It was humorous to everybody on the outside, but it wasn't humorous to seven people, these seven brothers. They didn't think it was funny. In fact, it was, it was quite scary. Now you think about, about, this, about this scene right here, and, and you think about evil forces that are in our world today. You think about that, and, and what, what, is the, what is the power of these evil forces? I'm going to tell you that, that the power of the evil forces in our world is stronger than any of us individually and probably all of us collectively. I'm going to tell you that because I want you to be, I want you to be mindful of what the enemy looks like. So this had to be a, a scary moment also, as they may have very much feared for their own lives in this particular circumstance. Now you think about this. One man, possessed with an evil spirit, was able to beat up and overpower seven other grown men. Seven grown men could not stand up against one man who was possessed with the forces of evil. How do you think you would do in that circumstance? You know, I've got a, one of my grandchildren is five, year, five years old. His name is Haddon. Haddon says, you know, I'll take a rock and I'll bust him in the head. That's what he said. That's, that's what five-year-old boys say. And that's great if you're five years old, but it doesn't work when you know and what, what you're dealing, dealing with. And so, so, so what do we do when we recognize that, that there are evil forces in the world that we're no match for? None of us can stand against the, 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 the evil forces that are out there. What then do we do? Well, thankfully, we have some advice and encouragement on what we should do. Now, remember, in Acts 19, Paul is in the city of Ephesus. He's in the process of spending about three years there, and he's planting a church. He's sharing the gospel. People are coming to faith in Christ. A church is being established. He's strengthening the church, and then he moves on to some other place. Well, after a few years of moving on to some other place, he writes a letter back to the church at Ephesus. In your Bible and mine, that letter is called the book of Ephesians because it's a letter from Paul written to the church in Ephesus. And here's what Paul says to that church years later. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. He's getting to the end of his letter, and he says, Finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He's reminding them that yes, the evil forces may be stronger than you are, <laughs> but we serve a God who's stronger than the evil forces. Amen. That's what we need to recognize. So be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Just like Paul was very quick to recognize that the miracles that were taking place were, was God working through him, not Paul doing anything. And so Paul is well acquainted with evil forces. He's well acquainted with miracles being done through him. He's well acquainted with, with how things work in the spiritual realm. And he says to the church there, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then he says this, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now Paul had been in many places. He had seen forces of evil close up and firsthand. He had experienced this over and over again. So he's saying, when you face the schemes of the devil, when you face the evil forces out in our world, understand you need something beyond yourself. So put this armor on that God's going to, God's going to provide for you. Verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He's reminding them. And he doesn't say it here in the book of Ephesians, but he may have been saying to them subconsciously, remember back when the seven brothers got whipped up on by that man with the evil spirit? Remember that? These forces that we're battling are above and beyond us. They're in the spiritual realm. And that's just a quick reminder. In the church, the enemy is not each other. Can I get an amen to that this morning? The, the enemy is not each other. The enemy is the spiritual forces coming against the people of God, and the things of God. And so, so, so he, says, he says, we're battling against these powers, this darkness, these forces of evil. And then he says, verse number 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all 
to stand firm. I'm thinking about Francis Scott Key looking out at Fort McHenry after the terrible battle that had raged all night before and the bombs that were bursting in air and all the, all the, 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 the smoke and the, and, and the armament and the people dying and, and fighting the battle. What happened the next day? Were they defeated or not? And he looks out there at daybreak and there flies the flag of the United States of America still standing in the same way in a spiritual sense. There's this spiritual battle that's going on. And Paul is saying, you need to put this armor on so that you can fight the battle, so that when the battle is over and the dust clears, you will still be standing in the name of our Lord Jesus. Isn't that good news? What do we do about these evil forces? We put on the armor. He goes on to talk about the armor. He says, put on the the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now look again at verse 16 on the screen. This is not a trick question. When the evil one fires his fiery darts at us, and we have the shield of faith, faith means we're believing and trusting in Jesus. How many, I'm asking the question, how many darts of the evil one are extinguished by faith? One, five, all but one, how many? All, all. See, we, how, we are positioned for victory because of what the Lord does in us and what the Lord does through us. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, and to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Whew, that's a mouthful. Well, listen, let me tell you. All these pieces of armor have a place, and, and, and not too long ago, maybe a year or so ago, if you remember, I preached through the armor of God, and it's a great study. But the most important thing that takes up the most part of this passage of Scripture is not the armor, but prayer. Prayer. Praying at all times for all the saints in the Spirit. That's the victory that we have. That's how we put on the armor of God. And in thinking about how to overcome the evil spirit with the Holy Spirit, in another place, 1 John 4.4, 4, it says this, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Isn't that good news? See, we fight an enemy that is stronger than we are, but we have a presence inside of us that is stronger than the enemy. So we don't have to to wonder, how's this thing going to turn out? When I'm trusting God and I put my faith in Him, all those darts are coming at me, He's going to lead me through faith that all those darts are going to be extinguished. The battle might get ugly and it might be tough, but in the end, when the dust settles, guess what? I'm still going to be standing, not because of me, but because of Jesus who lives inside of me. So the Holy Spirit overcoming evil spirits in my life, that can bring a mighty increase to the Word of God. I'm I'm in contact with some Christians that live in another part of the world that is dominated by darkness and evil. And just this week, I got a, a message on a secure line that there are, in this heavily Muslim area of the world, where forces of darkness and evil are prevalent. Three people in that area were baptized, professing their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that an amazing thing? That there are those in in such a a midst of of the forces of evil, there are those that are are facing uh, the expulsion from their home, from their job, from their family, and even their own life, that they're willing to say, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus, and they put on that armor, and they're able to withstand whatever the world throws at them, whatever the evil forces throw at them, knowing that in the end, however the dust settles, they will still be standing. And the same is true for you, and the same is true for me. Let me give you one more spiritual truth that we find in this passage of Scripture, and that is this. God can use spiritual defeat to bring about a spiritual victory. God can use a spiritual defeat to bring about a spiritual victory. We can look at what happened with these seven brothers and the demon-possessed man as a, as a spiritual defeat. These guys go in there, you know, in the name of Jesus, 
that Paul's talking about, come on out, and the guy jumps on all seven of them, whoops them, and they're, you, know, you know the story, right? But out of a seemingly spiritual defeat can come about a great spiritual victory. Let me take you back to verse 10 of Acts 19. In verse number 10, because of gospel teaching, because Paul and his companions are teaching the gospel of Jesus, because of that, everybody, it says everybody in that region came to hear the message of the gospel. That's a lot of people. Ephesus was a well-populated city. How big and how many? Hold on just a minute and I'll let you know. But because of gospel teaching, everybody heard about Jesus. Verse 11, because of gospel miracles, the handkerchief and the aprons and the healings and the demon-possessed people being, being released from that, because of that, evil spirits were delivered and healing took place in people's lives. And then we get to verses 16 through 20, this story of the, of the man that beat up the seven men and the evil spirit. And because of these seven sons of Sceva being whooped up on by the demon-possessed man, eight things are recorded as happening. Let me walk through them very briefly, and then we'll summarize here at the end of the message. Eight results. Number, first result, verse 17. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Everybody heard about this. Everybody. Those seven sons of Sceva, everywhere they went, somebody was whispering to somebody else, Hubert. Did you see? There they are right there. Who? Those guys that got whooped up on. Everywhere they went, people were talking about them. Everywhere that, that everybody, did you see, you know, the, the National Enquirer of the day, the Facebook of the day, the social media of the day, everybody in that area was talking about how these seven men got beat up by a demon-possessed man. That's what it says. And we call that a testimony. That's what happened. The second thing that happened, set verse 17, and fear fell upon them all. That word fear literally means, in the Greek language, scared and wanting to run away. <laughs> That's what these seven brothers were. They were scared and they wanted to run away. And when people heard about what happened, people that heard about it, they got scared. And they wanted out. What in the world's going on here? The third thing that happened, verse 17. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. That word extolled means to be made great. The name of Jesus was made great by these seven men getting beat up by a demon-possessed man. Why would that happen? Well, think of it this way. What did the demon-possessed man say? I keep coming back to it because it's important. The demon-possessed man said, Jesus, I know. And when was it that evil spirits were coming out of people? At the name of Jesus. Jesus, I know. And so, because Jesus was known and Jesus was making an impact, and the teaching about Jesus was bringing people to put their faith and trust in him, and the, the name of Jesus was bringing about these miracles of Paul, and the name of Jesus was bringing demons being delivered from people. The name of Jesus, at, the, at the, this man being beat up, these men being beat up, the name of Jesus was made great by that experience because people began to realize it's not about the seven sons, it's not about this person, it's not even about Paul, it's about Jesus. It's all about and always about Jesus. Verse, uh, verse number 18, the fourth thing that happened. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. Now, let me, let me explain this all too quickly. The people in Ephesus, before the gospel, were very religious. They worshipped the Greek mythology, the, the, the gods that we study about in school. They worshipped Artemis, who was the, the goddess of that area. The, the practices of the occult were rampant. And so, so people, it identifies them as believers. They were Christians, and they were coming out of that occultic, ungodly environment, and they were coming to know Jesus. They were coming into the church, but they were bringing some of those other things with them. And they weren't letting go of the worldly things that, that, that used to define their life. They were still holding on to them. Do you know what I'm talking about here? You don't understand, when, when, sometimes when people become believers and followers of Christ, they try to, instead of bringing Jesus into their whole life, they try to bring some other stuff from their old way of life into their Christian life. Don't be too holy with me today. We all know what that's like, right? There are those that when they become followers of Jesus, they, they take all the old way of life, they don't get rid of it, they just pack it up and set it somewhere to the side to go back and use it at some point in the future. That's what was happening here. 
And so these people, when the the story went out about these seven men getting beat up, the Christians came together and they started confessing their sins. They started confessing what they had had, had still held, were still holding on to. They started confessing what they were still involved with, even though they had put their faith and trust in Jesus. It's a reminder that you and I must always seek to be clean before the Lord and make sure that we're confessing any sin in our life. The fifth thing that happened, verse 19, a number of those who had practiced magic arts, that's the occult, they brought their books together. They, 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 they got so convicted. They, they were now Christians, but they were so convicted by what happened and the Spirit of God is moving. They took their occultic books and they brought them and they said, I, I got to get rid of these. So, so they brought them. They repented of their sin. They were confessing their sins. God was moving in a great way. The sixth thing that happened, verse 19, and they burned them in the sight of all. They made a big bonfire and they took these books that people have been holding on to. They said, let's just burn them all. And they put them on the pile. And, and then, then in verse Verse number 19, it says, And they counted the value, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. That's some expensive books, isn't it? In that day and time, any book was expensive because it took so much to, to, to produce a book. 50,000 pieces of silver. So either there were a lot of books, or there were less books, but they were very expensive. And it was probably both. 50,000 pieces of silver. Let me, let me put that in context. Each piece of silver was, in the Greek language was called a drachma. A drachma was one day's wage. So you went out and work in, in, in any of the different things, a farmer, a shepherd, uh, a, a producer of bricks, whatever it is, one day's wage was a drachma, one piece of silver. 50,000 pieces of silver, if you work seven days a week, is 136 years. That's, that's a lot of silver, isn't it? That's a lot of silver. And so the value of these books was such that there were so many books and so many people were under conviction. That lets me know it wasn't just a small church of 15 or 20 people. No, it was a large number of people that had turned from the occult and were following Jesus. And next week when we talk about the next passage of Scripture, you'll see exactly uh, what a large group of of, of people it was and what an impact it made. Now all that were the results of these seven men getting beat up. But notice the last result that we see here is our key verse, verse 20. All these things had happened, and then it says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. You know what this whole passage tells me? Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, God uses the tumultuous, chaotic, difficult times in our life to bring about spiritual awakening and revival. And if that's true, and it is, revival could be right around the corner in America in the days in which we live. Let me invite you to stand with me, if you will. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. After our prayer, we're going to sing our last song. And after our last song, we're going to be dismissed. And as we're dismissed, I'm going to be available. Our other staff members will be available. Our deacons, connect group leaders, they'll be available. Find somebody if you have a, a, a prayer request or a need or, or, some, or you just want to talk to somebody for a minute. After our first service this morning, there were a couple of people that wanted to hang around and talk and get some prayer. And, and so no doubt in a service like this, perhaps that's you. Don't leave until you find somebody that can share with you about Jesus. That said, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for today and for your blessings. Thank you for your word that teaches us to put our faith and our trust in you above all other things. Thank you for your word that reminds us that in the difficult, dark days that we may face, in the spiritual battles that we fight, in the the encounters that we have with evil forces, remind us again, Lord, we can't confront these on our own, but with Christ we can do all things. Because of Jesus living in us, we can have victory over forces of evil, and not one of the fiery darts will get through when we put our faith and our trust in you. And when the battle is over and the dust settles, we can still be standing because of you. Lord, may we, like Paul encouraged in Acts, I mean in in Ephesians chapter 6, may we pray. May we pray at all times. May we pray for all the believers. May we pray in all circumstances. May we not let our guard down. May we experience victory. 
And even when the times look tough, may we recognize that right around the corner, Lord, you have been working all along the way to bring about your good and perfect will that every person come to know you. Lord, send a revival. Lord, send an awakening. Send it to our nation. Send it to our state. Send it to our area. Send it to our church. But Lord, it never will happen anywhere if it doesn't start with me. So Lord, start it with me and with all those who've gathered in this place today. Use this time for your glory. And even as we sing now, as we're dismissed out, may we go, Lord, with a renewed sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God that gives victory to all who believe. Help us, Lord, to believe as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong with us today, you're dismissed. <laughs>